We're glad that you're here. We welcome you. Thank you for being a part of us, and thank you for sharing today with us as we worship our Lord together. We've got some folks that are sick with the virus and uh, allergies and so many other things that are going on. Uh, you want to remember Travis Balch. Travis has been in the hospital in Amarillo uh, since Thursday. Hopefully, he may get to come home today uh, if everything goes well. So you please pray for Travis, pray for Norma uh, during this time, and just pray that God will touch and heal and bless uh, in their lives. And I, I know that there are many uh, that we are praying for and lifting to the Lord because of uh, certain situations, and I appreciate you doing that. But we always want to remember to pray. And I know that there are people I've, I've heard over the last several weeks say we really appreciate the prayers because we feel those prayers. And folks, when we pray, then God is all around us. And we thank, we thank Him for that. But we are glad you're here. We want you to join us as we pray together and seek the Lord in, in His goodness and His grace. So join me as we pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this privilege to be in your presence. Father, we come before you, Lord, as humbly as we know how, confessing, Father, we're sinners. Father, I am a sinner. I have, I have sinned against you. And Lord, I pray that you touch our hearts, Father, and convict us of that sin. And Lord, may we confess that. And Lord, trust you and thank you for forgiveness that you give to us. Father, I pray now that you bless those in need today. I pray for Travis. I pray, Father, for healing. I pray, Father, that you would strengthen him and raise him up and have him back home. Bless Norma by his side, Father. Give her encouragement, wisdom, strength, comfort. Lord, just be with her and bless her in a very special way. Father, we thank you for the privilege of, of worship this morning. Lord, we thank you for what we just heard. And as we, the church, Father, we've come to share the name of Jesus. And Lord, to seek to exalt him and bring all honor and glory to you so father may you touch our hearts and may you bless us in a very special way and now father i pray that you touch the hearts of your people as we sing praises to you and worship you and lord we open our heart to hear from your word father as to what you need us to hear today father grant us grace and mercy and peace and love and lord speak to our hearts but father change our hearts Father, I pray that you begin to convict us now. And then, Lord, I pray that you bring that change in our hearts and our lives. Father, that we would turn ourselves over to you and give you all honor and glory and praise. Father, we pray for the salvation of souls and the changing of lives. Decisions to be made to say yes to all that you've given to us and done for us. And now, Father, we praise you and thank you for this hour that we worship. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I'm so glad that you're here. If you're our guest on your worship folder, there's a portion that says, Welcome to Central Baptist. It's perforated. Fill that out, tear it off, put it in the offering plate. But right now, we want to shake your hand, hug your neck. Let's all stand together and love somebody in the name of the Lord. Good morning. Welcome to the Sunday morning worship service of Central Baptist Church in Pampa, Texas. I'm Norman Rushing, pastor of the church. It's a joy to welcome you and to thank you for being a part of us and sharing this time with us. Those that are listening by radio, those that are watching us on Facebook, we're so thankful for each and every one of you. And we want you to know that we appreciate you. We thank God for you. And we're just trusting God to continue to bless and minister to your heart and your life. And we just pray that God uh, blesses you as you seek to worship Him each and every Sunday with us. But once again, we invite you. Come and be a part of us. Come and share this time as our people are moving about greeting each other. We want to greet you as well. So come and share that time with us and, and just uh, spend the time in the presence of the Lord with the people of God. As our people move about and greet each other, 
Uh, we want you to know that we have the same greeting for you as well. If you're working today, God bless you. We pray the Lord ministers to you and blesses you. We pray the Lord touches you and uh, just trusting God to keep you safe uh, where you are. In a moment, I want you to take your Bible and join me. Now, we're going to, to talk today about the last church of the seven churches of Asia. This is the church of Laodicea. And I want you to join me because it's, it's something that reminds us that God's still in control of this world. And folks, it's not going to last forever. But He loves us so much that He wants to warn us that there will come a day when the door will close. And that's the door of grace. We've got to be ready for that. So I hope you have your Bible ready. Turn to chapter 3 of the book of Revelation. The last several verses uh, in that chapter. Look at those. The church at Laodicea. We'll see what God has to say to us. I'm glad that you're a part of us. Thank you for sharing this time with us. God bless you. We love you in the Lord.
thankful that you did, Lord. And Father, may we just love you and praise you and serve you as to, to kind of to show appreciation for it, Lord. Our, our, our best is filthy rags, but Lord, we have you in our heart and we just thank you when you look at us, you see the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Father, just thank you for that. Father, we just pray for Brother Norman and as they lead us, uh, speak through us, through the song, and through the word. We ask you to be this offering that would be used to honor and glorify you, Lord, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Amy and Gina. Take your Bible this morning. Join me in the book of Revelation, chapter 3. We have come to the seventh church in the churches that Jesus wrote to, the churches of Asia, uh, as they are referred to. And this also brings us to a conclusion of the book of Revelation. And I told you last year sometime when we began uh, the study of Revelation that I was going to do these seven churches later and not along with that. And so we began the first of this year talking about the seven churches. And all of them deal with the church age from the time of John, which we're talking about the Apostle John from him up until today. 
every one of these churches, the six that we have already talked about, the seventh uh, that we are approaching, are those that indicate to us what the church age is about. But I found it appropriate that we come to the church at Laodicea on Valentine's and to just think about how much God really loves us. You know, this, this is the time of the year when we express our love to each other. Now, for men, it is a time Tuesday, no, Monday, tomorrow, tomorrow, don't forget this. Tomorrow is the day that you tell your wife you love her. And tell her next year at the same time, you'll do it again. <laughs> so you get all caught up for the year. And you express, you express your love. You, you, you buy certain things or you uh, don't buy certain things. You eat certain things or you don't eat certain things. But it's a time that we are to remember what love is all about. Now, I got to thinking about Valentine's Day. And I just want to share some, just a few little things with you. Statistically, Americans last year for Valentine's spent $21 billion. That's Valentine. Now, folks, that, that's a lot of chocolate and a lot of flowers and a lot of getting out of the doghouse is what a lot of it is. <laughs> but the interesting thing is, See, we'd already been through nine months of COVID or 10. And so the, the spending was $21 billion. In the year 2020, the year before, in February, before we were locked down by this COVID thing, Valentine's Day brought in $27.4 billion. We dropped down $6 billion dollars. Uh, because of the virus. Now, here's another interesting thing that I, I thought was uh, quite interesting to me. There was $886 million spent on pets for Valentine's Day. $886 million on a pet. I'm glad mine's dead. Now, what, what, I, what, I get, what I couldn't get out of this was, what do you do? You buy a dog a card and you hold it down there so he can read it? I'm, I'm just wondering. I didn't know milk bones cost that much. But somehow we spent that much money on pets. And then this, and I'm, I'm sure that you will know this right off. 85% of cards... Valentine's cards that were sent, were they sent by the woman or the man? Huh? Be careful. The woman or the man? Man? Well, Lord, no, the women did it. Eighty-five percent. Eighty-five percent of the cards that were sent, which means... Only 15% were given to the women. Right? Some of you are saying, I got to figure it out. Ten, four. Trust me. A woman don't send a Valentine's card to herself, do they? So 15% men sent. Which means that 85% of the women were left out. See? Now, you work on that after a while. <laughs> Valentine's Day. I love you. Valentine's Day. A day that we say, we set it aside so that we remember to say, I love you. But folks, every breath you take, God says, I love you. I love you. That song we just sang a moment ago, Oh, how he loves you and me. 
Can you just, you know, it's just hard to really grasp. Uh, as Joe said there a minute ago, it's really hard for us to understand why God would love me. I don't, I don't get that. And yet he loves me with everything that he has. And I'm glad I don't have to understand that. God loves us so much. And, and we express that. Not long ago we sang, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. So we got that down. And ever so often we'll, we'll quote that verse, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And we, we hear that word from John. We, we sing the song about Jesus loves me. But somehow within that, that song it becomes so rote that we, it just flows off of us. Now most people know the first verse. And some people know the last verse, but very few people know all four verses to Jesus loves me. Unless you pick up another hymnal, there's only three verses. And then you go to another hymnal, there's five. And you go to another hymnal, there's 27. It's whatever you want to make it. But even though we put all of these verses for Jesus loves me, we miss the depth of God's love. Somehow we overlook that, just how much God really loves us. This church of Laodicea is the last church age church. Now, we're, we'll talk about Laodicea and the city of Laodicea and how it was uh, affected in, in different ways about uh, its wealth and all the things that they had. And, and there were some things around that about Laodicea is close to two cities, Colossae, which Paul wrote to, Paul started, and then there's a city of Hierapolis. And those two cities come into play with the area of Laodicea. Now, Laodicea was the, the uh, most rich church out of all the churches that we have here. But Laodicea found itself uh, full of people that uh, did banking at that particular time. There was a lot of trade that came through that city there. But the thing that kept Laodicea uh, alive, along with the banking and the gold and all of these other things, was the water. The water from Colossae helped to build. Uh, th there was just strata around all of this, and water flowed from that. Pure and fresh water. In Colossae, the water was very cool. And so they would, they would bring that water down. In Hierapolis, Hierapolis had a warm water. And that warm water they would send down into uh, Laodicea. And they built spas and baths. Where you could find healing with the warm water. So here is a city. They get cool water from this side, they get, they get warm water from the other side, and they use it so differently. Laodicea was such a rich city, there were times when uh, in that area there that the cities were destroyed by earthquakes. Laodicea was destroyed by an earthquake in AD 60. And Rome came in and said, we will help you rebuild, and Laodicea said, we don't need you. We can build it back ourselves. In fact, there was a building that was built there, and it was dedicated to one, one particular individual that spent the money to build this, this great large building in Laodicea. But they built it back because they were so rich, had everything they needed, and they said, we don't need your help. And what you're going to see here as we read this, this is the last church, and I told you last week that we were blessed to be a part of the church of the open door. This was the church of the missionaries. But every one of these church churches during this church age period, from the time of the apostles until today, those church ages, the first church, it began to meld into the second church. And then that church went for so many years, and then it, would, it began to take a, a different 
stand, but it all went in to the next one and the next one and the next one. And now we've come to the very last church, which is where we are today in 2022. We are here, the open door church, but sadly, the door is closing. I read the other day, and I'm just going to say this from my perspective, and you I'm not saying anything to you, but I've, I've refused to watch the Olympics for a couple of three reasons. And one of those reasons is this. China, at this very moment, is beginning to strip all of the Christianity off the Internet, off the of television, off of radio, and they are putting pressure on the Christian people that they will no longer be able to share their gospel. There is a tribe of Muslims that came from Mongolia into the northern part of China, a very peaceable group of people. And genocide from the Chinese government is being perpetrated on this group of people. They're killing them. They'll start killing the, the Christians. They're going to shut the door. And they're going to do their best to shut the door into China with the gospel. Russia is shutting their door. Not allowing the gospel, not allowing Christianity to flourish. And it is the government that stops that. Other places, the door is closing. Now you know what that means to us? That means that we are now moving into what we would refer to as the last church of the church age, which means, and we'll see this here in just a second, which means that we are coming to the time when the door of grace that is opened by God so that we might come. And he said at the very end of this book, whosoever will may come. That door is going to close. Now, folks, here's the reason for the title of my message today. God loves us so much. He wants to warn us, this day will come. Do you hear me? Now, you may, and and I know people do, they think I'm a hard preacher. They they think I, you know, I I don't tell a lot of stories and I don't do anything except share the gospel with you. Because, folks, sharing the gospel means that we understand what the truth of the Word of God says. And so that's what we're going to look at today. Very quickly, look with me in chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. And let's read about Jesus' letter to the church at Laodicea. Verse 14, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Now we'll explain some of this in just a second. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest thou that thou art wretched wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel you, Jesus said, to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou might be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness does not appear, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. The word sup means to fellowship. I will fellowship with you and you with me. To him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To all seven churches, he says, listen to me. 
Because in all seven of these churches, Jesus is warning us that this church age that began with the apostles is slowly dying away. And we have come to the very last. Number seven, completeness, perfection as far as God is concerned. And he wants us to understand that he wants us, to, wants to warn us that the day will come when this church age will close. Now, notice with me, if you will, how he began this. In verse 14, he calls himself the amen, the faithful, and the true witness. You see, God loves us so much, he wants to warn us of our concessions. In other words, the compromises that we make to say, oh, it's okay. Everything's okay. It's all good. We can just ignore these things and go away. John's not writing this. He's writing it down. This is not an angel. This is Jesus Christ himself that has come and speaking to warn us. And he identifies himself as, first of all, the amen. Now, to you and I, that means at the end of a prayer. When I first began to preach some uh, two or three years ago, in all the churches there I, that I went, there were people all over the church that said, Amen. If they hear something that they like, when I first came here, we had several. There was a dear fellow that sat right back here. You all know who I'm talking about. And he amened all through the service. So we understand that word amen. It means so mote it be. Yes, it's right. I agree with you. Those type things. But when Jesus said this, it is, it is a title for him, for Christ. He is called the Amen, the affirmation of God. In 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 20, it says that he is the fulfillment of the purpose of God. He is the Amen of God. But when I read that, the first thing that came to my mind was, he is the final word of God. And he's speaking the final word here. This is the amen. You see, because we say, okay, I agree with you. And it used to be in, in, in the time of Christ when, when the speakers would speak and they would teach. Then rather than talking about, well, I agree with you. At the end of it, they would say, amen. I agree with everything that you said. Now, Jesus is that agreement with us and with God. He is the final word of God. He is the surety of God. He is God himself. He is God's grace. And he is God's truth. So now Jesus said, I am the amen. Then he said, I am the faithful and true witness. Now, if you have your Bible open, just turn a page over into chapter one and look at verse five. When John begins to introduce this revelation of Jesus Christ. He says, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. He is the faithful witness. This tells us about God, <coughs> that God has sent his son, that he, re he might remind us that there is a way that we can come to God. And it is only through Jesus that God is revealed. Folks, keep in mind. Please understand this. God is spirit. We worship God in spirit and in truth. And God is spirit. How can we know him? How can we look and say, here is God. He is spirit. This is what, what is so amazing to me about what God did. God enfleshed himself. He took on flesh. And he came down to this earth and they called him Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. But more than that, Jesus the Christ, he is the salvation of God. Jehovah saves is what that word Jesus means. Yahshua from the Old Testament. That's what Jesus name was. Yahshua, Jehovah saves the Christ, the Messiah. He has come to us. He is the faithful witness for us to know about what God has for us. He is the truth. 
I am the faithful witness and the true witness. Everything about God comes from Jesus Christ. He teaches us the truth. And guess what? He teaches us the truth that there is such thing as heaven. Now, folks, the older you get, and I learned this here not too long ago, the older you get, the more heaven becomes sweeter to you. It just, it just seemed like it's just, you know, there, there's not anything in this world that you can't say, I, I've been there, done that. Are there some things you say, I hadn't been there and I'm not going to do that. But all of a sudden, we have this desire to be with him. And Paul said in the book of Philippians, he said, I'm in a, I'm in a, I'm in a tight spot here. It's good for me to be here with you, but I'd rather be with Jesus. And when we begin to think about it, he reminds us, I've gone to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. And where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Jesus said, I am preparing a way in my father's house. We are going to live with him. Where is that? I don't know. Doesn't matter. It's where Jesus is. We call it heaven. And we look forward to the time when we'll have a brand new body. No joints will hurt. We're not going to have to put up with cold. We're not going to have to put up with hot. We're going to have everything in perfection because of what Jesus has done for us. And he tells us this and said, this is the truth. We read this. No more tears. He wipes away the tears from our eyes. Everything is good and perfect in heaven. But he said there's a hell. Wait a minute. Lord, surely there's, there's no hell. There's, there, used to be a, there was a song back in the 60s. And I look around and some of you, well, quite a few of you would remember it if you listened to the 60s music. But the song in it says, I swear there ain't no heaven and I pray there ain't no hell. Now, that, that was those guys that we called hippies that stayed high most of the time. But they made a lot of money by saying that. And you know what, what the problem with that is? Is that the, a lot of people believe that. Swear there ain't no heaven, and I pray there ain't no hell. Well, I've got news for you. Yes, there is a heaven, but yes, there is a hell. There's a hell where the fire is never quenched and the worm never dies. You know how I know that? Because the truth told me that. There is a hell where Satan will be cast to the very bottom with the Antichrist and with the false prophet. And I dare say you find people like Hitler and Hugh Hefner and people like that that are there at the bottom with him in torment and in pain. You say, but I'm a good old boy. I, made, I just never had, took time to find Jesus. Why would God send me to hell? He's not sending you to hell. You've chosen that path. And hell waits for you. And you will be separated from God. You'll be separated from your family. You'll be separated from your friends. You'll be separated from everything that you know is good and what you have right now. Folks, the truth is this. There's a heaven and there is a hell. In Jesus, you receive him just as he told you. You'll be in heaven with him. But if you refuse him, you choose to be separated from God and you'll spend eternity in hell. Where the fire is never quenched and the worm never dies and darkness surrounds you. That's the truth. And that's what Jesus is teaching us here. But he also teaches us that there's a door of salvation. And he said, I'm the door. And the door is open to us. You can be saved right now and, and uh, miss all of that. Or you can choose to just walk away from God. And find yourself in eternity separated from him. And it may be sooner than you think. Because the door is going to close. Christ is the beginning of creation, he says in that same verse. He is the agent of creation. In John chapter 1, 
John said that there wasn't anything made except was made by him. He is the one that, that the agent that God used to bring about all of creation. And if you read Colossians verse, chapter 1, verses 15 through 20, you read about Jesus is preeminent in the, in the creation and everything else. He is first. He is first over all of these things. But then he says to us, I know your works. Now that word for works means deeds. I know your deeds. I know the things that you're doing. He knows your hearts. And here's what he's saying to you as he says in verse 14, 15. You may fool everybody around you. You may put on a good show. You have, may have a great smile. And you may just kind of come and, and do whatever you want to do. And, and claim to everybody how wonderful you are in the church and with Christ. But here's what he's saying. You're not fooling me. Right. <laughs> Fool everybody else. But you're not fooling me. I know you. Yes. And folks, he's not saying, he never, in these verses here, 14 through 22, he never commends the church at Laodicea. Never commends them. And he says to them, you're not fooling me. You may think you're hot stuff. Cold or hot. You think you're hot stuff. You think you've got everything. It's all in for him because you see, I come to church on Sunday. And I sit, and I endure, and then I get to go home. Everything's good. I bring money. And I give them the money, and, it, and it, it's in the church. But that doesn't light your fire, folks. Cold. Cold. Turned against him. Jesus said, I wish you were cold. He wasn't saying, I wish you were uh, indifferent to me. That's not what he's saying there. He says, the problem that you have is you're in between. You won't make up your mind. So you're in between here. That's what he's talking about here. And he says, you are lukewarm. You ever had to drink lukewarm water? Only when you wanted to throw up. Now, I, I grew up in a house that had gyp water that ran into the, to the house. And you didn't drink that stuff. We had a well. We pumped it into a bucket. And that's where we had our water. But I went to, I.B. and I went several years ago in St. Augustine, Florida to the Fountain of Youth. Remember that? The Fountain of Youth. And so you, you go through there and, and you see this, this fountain as well, whatever it is. But they'll give you a drink of that water. That, that was found at that particular time is supposed to make everybody uh, young again. And so we went in and, and we got a cup and there was a couple there beside us and they had a dog with them. And we got our cups and we downed that water and it was cool. But that was the nastiest most mineral laden water I'd ever drank in my life. And the best part of the whole deal was that couple drank theirs and then they, they gave them a cup for the dog. And I'm not lying here. I'm, I'm not, I'm not preaching anymore. I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> they got, they got a cup for that dog and they held it down there for the dog to drink. And that dog put his nose down there and he went, Pfft. He was the smartest one of all four of us there. I ain't drinking that. That stuff is nasty. I can still see that dog. And I wish I was as smart as a dog. Now, folks, you, you, none of us want lukewarm anything. I don't want my food lukewarm, do you? I like it. I like it hot, warm, whatever it might be. I sure don't want lukewarm water. It's full of minerals. There were aqueducts that came into Laodicea from Hierapolis and other places. And they have found, as they found those aqueducts, they, they dug into them and they were laced with minerals so thick. The water was bad. It was nasty that, flew in, that flowed into Laodicea. And Jesus said, you're just like that water. You're lukewarm. 
All of these minerals that make it bad when it ought to be good. So what is that? What is lukewarmness today? Here's, here, here's lukewarm. Pride. I'm too proud to admit that I'm really not the Christian that I'm supposed to be. Or I'm too proud to admit that I've never asked Jesus into my heart to save me. But I'm going to go on living with this, this front in front of me so nobody will ever guess. Because I'm too prideful to admit I've sinned and I need a Savior. Fear. People become afraid. What's somebody going to say? What difference does it make? Folks, when it comes to your understanding of what is waiting for us after we leave this earth, and none of us are getting out of here alive, we all know that little statement. What does it hurt for us to to man up and throw our pride aside and say, fear nothing, I'm going to see Jesus? Religion. I'm religious. Hallelujah. Are you a Christian? Have you been saved? Have you trusted Jesus as your Savior? There's nothing else can do that. And it's all contained within what God says to us. We're self-centered. It's all about me. People ought to come see me. People ought to look at me. People ought to, to make sure that I'm taken care of. It's all about me and everything that I want to do. And Jesus said, you're not fooling me. In your church, there's no enthusiasm. There's no compassion. You look around and and there are people that sit there and say, I don't like this one, this one, this one, and this one. And we call that worship. We can't do that. We've got to turn ourselves back to God. And he said there needs to be a zeal. And so the truth is, it doesn't mean that you make me sick when it says I'll spew you out of my mouth. It doesn't mean that. Very, Very simply, it means this. I will vomit you up. From here out, I will vomit you up. That's how sick you make me. You see, this, this church represents a lot as to what is going on now in our nation and all around our world. We've got, we've got preachers that want to be CEOs. We've got, peop- we've got preachers that don't pastor anymore, and I can talk about them because I are one. They don't pastor anymore. They, they say, I don't, I don't need to go to the hospital because that just takes too much of my time. And you know how I know that? Because I've heard them say that. I was listening to a group one time at lunch at one of meeting I was at. And they were talking about, no, you don't go to the hospital. You send somebody else out there. That's not your job anymore. What you need to do is stay in and, and, and do this and this and this. God bless them. I had to get up and leave before I said something. Because the older I get, I'm not ashamed to say something. And I got up and I moved away from them. Because, folks, I'm going to tell you something. You and I do not need to live such a life as to say, I'm I'm going to be the CEO and I'm going to run this. And everybody's going to do what I say. Or you bring me all the money. Send me the money. Give me the money. And people are still doing that. What in the world for? The money doesn't belong to me. The money belongs to Almighty God. It's not mine, it's your, it, and it's not yours. It belongs to God. And we give those things to Him. And then Jesus begins to speak to us about the truth, about our conceit. He said, you're deceiving yourself. Verse 16, He said, I'm going to vomit you up. But look at verse 17. You say, I am rich and increased with goods. I have needed nothing. That's what they said to Rome. We'll build this thing back by ourselves. They're wealthy. They had a money exchange there. They had gold all around. They had an ISAB that was worldwide. And people would come and get it, and and they would put the powder on their eyes, and it was supposed to improve their vision. They had a a particular kind of sheep. It It was dark black wool, very shiny. And they sold that stuff all over the world. And all of this money came into them. And yet they sit in their church, and they say, We're wonderful. We've got all the money we need, and we all meet together, and then we go home, and and we come if we want to or we don't have to. And they very conceitingly say, I've got it all. I don't need God. So the church said to Rome, I don't need you. And we sit back and say, I don't need you, God. That's what's happening today. 
We don't want to talk about God. We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. We don't want to talk about sin. We sure don't want to talk about hell. We don't want to mention those things because you see that's going to run everybody off. And we sit around and we lie to ourselves and we say, oh, well, it's all good because we're all trying to go to the same place. Folks, let me tell you something. I am going to heaven through Jesus Christ because I've accepted him as my savior and I confess my sins. And it wasn't just a one-time thing back when I was 12 years old that I confessed my sins. And he said, okay, you're good. Go do whatever you want to. I spent mo- I spend most of my day saying, oh, God, forgive me. Oh, God, forgive me. Oh, God, I, did- I didn't mean to think that. Oh, God, I didn't mean to say that. Oh, God, I didn't mean to do that. Oh, God, I should have done that. You spend your time mostly saying, dear God, I have sinned. And he says to him here, you say that you don't need us anymore. But he says, you call yourself good, and I'm telling you, you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. That's how God sees you. And that's how God is looking at this world even today. He said, you're, you're wretched. In other words, you're, you're miserable. You're in misery. Even within yourself, and you don't even recognize it and don't even know it. You're miserable. In other words, you need to be pitied. You need to be pitied because of the way we are and what we're doing. And he says you're poor, and that's talking about abject poverty. Not just that you don't have uh, enough of something. It means you have absolutely nothing. And he said you're blind. They're the city with the eye sad. Jesus said you can't even see. And you deceive yourself. And you can't see what's going on. And then he said, you're naked. Well, they've got the wool. They've got the linen. They've got everything that they need. They can get whatever they want and make the fin- finest of garments and do everything that they need to be doing. And he said, this is who you are and what you look like. So Jesus said, here's, a, here's what you do. Here's what I'm telling you. Buy gold tried in the fire. Now, all of us know about gold. Gold is melted, and the impurities rise to the top. And then you scoop them off, and you get rid of them, all the impurities. And then you have nothing but pure gold. Folks, Jesus Christ came to this earth, and he walked on this earth, and he lived this life without any sin in his life. He is the purity. When we come to him and ask him to be our savior, what we're doing is we're getting rid of the impurities that are in our life and we confess our sins and he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Pure gold. Pure gold is our salvation that comes through him. I counsel you, try, try the gold in fire that you can be rich. The white raiment. He's not talking about making a new suit. He's talking about righteousness. In the righteousness of God, put on that that robe of righteousness. The righteousness that we have only through Jesus Christ. And that you may be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness does not appear. Anoint your eyes with eye sand. It's a play what Jesus said here because they had the eye salve I've told you about that but guess what he wanted you see many of us that that we can be a church member and you're blind to everything that God has for you that we need to be doing and serving and telling people he said open your eyes and the only way we can do that and see is to have him touch our eyes with forgiveness and cleansing and a touch of power and grace that flows within us and our eyes are opened he loves you as a friend and he wants you to know what's going on and he warns us he loves us so that we will obey his commands as many as i love i rebuke he disciplines us because he loves us i'll rebuke you Because you're not doing what you said you're doing. And you're not being who you are. If you are, you need to change that. I rebuke you and chasten you. He will punish us. 
He will get us back on the right road just like we would our children. And how do we do that? He said, repent. That means to change. Turn around and change. And in verse 20. Verse 20 is very familiar to all of you. Saw, saw a lot of people use it in, in telling people about Christ. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Now, that all of us recognize and realize that this, this was a, a painting by William Holden back in the 1800s. <clears throat> and, and the title of the painting is Jesus, Light of the World. And if you ever remember that, he's standing at a door. And he's standing like this. The door's right here. And as he stands at that door, you see all these vines and things growing around it like because there hadn't been anybody in and out that door in a long time. And Jesus is standing with a lantern in his hand. That's why it's referred to as the light of the world. And Jesus is standing there and he's knocking. He's got the light. He's knocking. When that painting came out, they hung it in London and the art critics jumped on it right quick. And the art critics said, you didn't put the doorknob on the door. You missed it. You missed it. And the artist looked at him and he said, I didn't miss it. There is no knob on the door outside. Jesus is not going to barge in your life and take it over. He wants to know if you'll open it to him. Okay, you got that picture? Now, understand this. Those words are not spoken to an individual, which there's nothing wrong with using it to tell somebody, you need to open your heart to Jesus. That verse was written to the church. The last church. And Jesus is standing at the door of that church age. And he wants to know if the church will let him in. Not an individual. He's not in the churches. Who's going to turn the knob? Who's going to let him in? Because you know what's fixing to happen? That's what's fixing to happen. And he backs up. And he said, Father, it's done. And God will shut the door. Folks, right now, you and I need to understand God loves you so much. He wants you to know that there is coming an end to this earth as we know it today. He wants you to know that the only way that you can come into heaven is that you come through Christ. He died on the cross for your sins. He shed his blood for your sins. They buried him, but he rose again. And he lives today, but he is coming back today. And now is the time. Behold, the day is the day of salvation. He's waiting for you. Oh, Lord Jesus, come in. Come in. Let him save you. He wants to save you today. That's how much he loves you. Because we don't ever know when that door will finally close. He loves you. How much do you love him? Have you ever accepted him as your savior? Or just joined a church? Or gone through a ritual? Today is the day when you open your heart and say, Lord, save me. How about you? Let's pray together. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. If you're here this morning without Christ, I want to lead you in a prayer. I want you to accept Him as your Savior, and you can do it. If you'll open your heart in faith and believe what you're about to ask God, about to, ask God to do, you pray with me this prayer. Dear Father, I know that I'm a lost sinner. I believe Jesus Christ died for me. I believe he rose again. By faith, Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. Forgive me of all of my sin. Save me, Lord. Be the Lord and Savior of my life. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving my soul. 
If you pray that prayer with me, I want you to get up. Nobody's looking. I want you to walk down here, and I'll see you in just a few minutes. You come. Let me tell you what you need to do. You want to pray that prayer, get up and come. If you didn't, I want to pray it with you. Maybe you need a church home. Sacrifice. Obedience is more to him than sacrifice. Would you come and be obedient to him? Don't let anybody else keep you from it. So this is where I need to be. This is where I need to serve. This is where I need to, to uh, share who Jesus is in my life. You come. By letter, by statement for baptism, you come. We'll work all of that out. He's calling to you. If you're willing to receive him, if you're willing to open the door and let him in, you need to come right now. Let me help you. You come. Father, in the name of Jesus, give us the boldness to step out and to recognize it's not about church membership, Lord. It's about salvation through Jesus. Lord, bless us now. Help us to turn ourselves over and repent so that we can be used of you. Blessed Father, help us to step out and say yes in Jesus' name. As we stand together and as we sing, I invite you to come. Come now. Come quickly. better than sacrifice. Obey the Lord today. He's tugging at your heart. Open that door. I want to save you. I want to change you. You come. Maybe you say, but I know Jesus, but your life is not what it should be. Come and let's pray about that. Let's turn it over to him. The day's coming. The door is going to close. Folks, God loves you too much to let that happen to you. He wants in. He wants, he wants to be in with you. But you've got to open the door. That's all it takes. One step. He'll open his arms. He'll receive you. Because he loves you. He loves you with everything that he has. Come and receive it. Come and know it. Oh God. Give your life to Him right now. Before it's everlastingly too late to make that commitment. Come to it. Are you willing? Thank you so much for being here, for sharing this time with us uh, today, and, and I appreciate you. Now, remember, we're, we're not having any services here tonight. Uh, many of you have signed up, and we're going to go upstairs, and we're going to eat together and fellowship together. It's, a, it's our gift from the church to you uh, to say thank you for being faithful. Uh, and so we're going to fellowship together, stay together once you're finished. Uh, you can go on home. There's nothing else to do here. But I hope to see you Wednesday. We'll be studying in the book of James. Come and be a part of that and share that time with us today. Now let me remind you, in just a moment, we can go up, up the stairs here. If you can't get up the stairs, well, come let me know. I'll be back here. There's a ramp there. We've got wheelchairs. We can get you up there uh, any way you want to do it. Uh, we can do that. So you come and let me know, and I'll make sure that it happens for you. And so come and join us. If you're, if you're here, come and join us and, and be a part of who we are. Thank you for sharing this time with us. God bless you. And we're not going to dismiss as we usually do.
because I'm going to pray and ask the Lord to bless our food. And then we're just going up the stairs to the left, and then you'll turn back to the right towards the fellowship hall, and everything will be right there for you, okay? So let's ask the Lord to bless, and then we'll dismiss and, and go and share our time together.